you know, to quote one of my favorite rappers, Flavor Flav, he once said, don't, uh, don't believe the hype. And I kind of feel like right now, man, oh man, we're literally recording this right before NVIDIA is going to announce their quarterly earnings, or I guess full year earnings, really. And it just like everything seems to be predicated on what is artificial intelligence going to do? What's NVIDIA going to do? Bob, is this market just going to go to the moon? I want to know. Well, here's the good news, guys. Um, artificial intelligence is artificial. It's just not intelligent. Um, and I think that's what the big, I think that's what everybody's missing. Everybody's missing the point that this is a technological innovation that we've had for centuries, right? We've always had technological innovation, whether it was the wheel or, you know, fire, um, you know, or electricity, right? We, we, we always have innovation, which is what drives, you know, the economy. Eventually, every, every company is going to be an AI company. Um, so there's nothing artificial about that. But don't get confused. You know, don't confuse brains with a bull market or intelligence when it comes to AI. Well, Cord, I mean, you're on CNBC every week, um, and it seems like that's all they can talk about in CNBC is AI this, AI that. And it just like, I always feel like when whatever the topic of conversation is the same thing over and over again, that's not the best opportunity. Am I wrong? Yeah, it's not even just on CNBC. If you listen to pretty much any earnings call, every CEO and CFO is is forcing in artificial intelligence sometimes in their earnings calls because they know it's such a buzzword right now, which is fascinating. Um, but it's interesting right now because, yeah, you point out NVIDIA. And what's happening in the overall markets is, is basically five companies. It used to be seven, but now it's really only five companies that are leading the whole stock market rally. So I'll get clients who say, oh, I heard the markets were up today or, oh, I heard they were down today. But normally it has to do with the fact that one of those companies is going up or down. So whatever happens to NVIDIA today, if it goes up, it might look like the whole markets are going up. If it goes down, it might look like the whole markets are going down. That is not a picture of the overall markets. It is a very large part of it currently because it's so large. But just keep in mind, if you are in a well-diversified portfolio, you own a lot of other areas that you don't have to be so dependent on. Yeah. If one of these companies does miss on their earnings and it drags the market down, you can, you want to make sure you own those other pieces of the market. Well, I'll true. translate for Courtney that, yes, NVIDIA was up and the market was up. Your portfolio wasn't. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just goes to show you like how under diversified everybody is, you know, getting into into so much of these, uh, chasing these uh, these few stocks. Like today, for example, Palo Alto Networks announced their earnings, uh, which came out really great. But somehow the stock's down 25 percent. I know that's that's a big kick in the teeth. And at 25 percent in one day or one hour, that's volatility. But, we, you know, we had companies up 58 percent in one day or 20 20- 20% in one day. Uh, you don't see that type of volatility when things are stable. But, you know, here's what I've learned about investors. Investors don't invest for a bull market. They chase it. And you got a lot of money chasing a few names. And I'll tell you guys, after doing this for almost 50 years, that never ends well. Never. It doesn't, but can always get crazier uh, sooner than later. And I think that's the problem right now, right? There's so much liquidity out there. You know, one of the stats we love to... Mm. The quote is just the fact that there's like six to seven trillion dollars between money markets and cash equivalents. And at some point, investors start thinking, wait a second, this 5%, it's not going to last forever. And by the way, on this 5%, not only do I have inflation eating away at that return, which is what, like close to 3%, then I've got to pay taxes on that 5%. You're actually getting a 0% return when you factor in inflation and taxes. And meanwhile, that momentum just keeps picking up in the market. And we know, to your point, Bob, investors, what do they do? They go for they go for this shiny object, right? And the shiny object right now is the S&P 500. It's mega cap tech. We talk about it every week, but they're chasing that return. But it's only going to get crazier, in my opinion. Well, I know you guys want to thank me, but I'll, I'll allow you to do it now ahead of time because this is what I saved you from. This is the kind of stuff that I did when I was a rookie broker back in my days at Mother Merrill. You, know, you come up with these ideas. Well, hey, let's take advantage of this rally. What we'll do is we'll buy these speculative stocks and we'll put stops in, right? But you don't realize when you, you buy a, you know, a company like Palo Alto and you put your stop in, you know the stock trades after hours, so it gaps down. So it's suddenly a stock opens, you're down 25%. Oh, wait a minute, I had a 3% stop. How do I lose 25%? Well, welcome to the market of speculation. So you know all these crazy ideas I hear over and over again, let's just chase these stocks with like tight stops, like, that never works. I mean, none of this stuff works. It's not investing. It's gambling. It's speculation. Dad, you know, Ryan would have felt a lot more grateful if you would have had him get in at NVIDIA at $5 a share. <laughs> What's really going on, right? We just had uh, a really hot CPI number followed by a hot PPI number. 
Is inflation transitory, like you've been saying, or does it look a little more sticky now after these two reports? Well, again, the bottom line is, does it really matter? <laughs> you know, because at the end of the day, okay, maybe the Fed cut sooner, maybe they, they cut later, but bottom line is you've got a hot employment market, you've got a tight labor market. We know GDP growth is looking good for the first quarter. That usually translates into pretty good revenues and earnings, and that's what we should expect moving forward. And I'd also mention here, too, everyone's talking about how narrow this bull market's been. That's actually not true, right? If you look at everything bottomed out in October of last year, and since then, financials have outperformed the S&P 500. Industrials have outperformed the S&P 500. Small caps have outperformed the S&P 500. So really, over the last couple of months, a lot of different places have been working. Just because in the last month or so, they haven't, that's not really a trend. So, Don't forget pipelines, right? Don't forget pipelines. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of places uh, right now that are actually working. And, you know, it's a good time to play capital everywhere else. We've been talking about that a lot. And I know, Cordy, you know, every week seems like on CNBC, you know, a lot of the same names they keep talking about, whether it's Disney, whether it's uh, Apple, just seems like, you know, there's so many stocks they're not talking about. And, you know, there's thousands of stocks they could be talking. Absolutely. I, I appreciate all the CNBC plugs, Ryan. We're just trying to get everybody to tune in and watch <laughs> either. Uh, but that's absolutely right. Everyone is really just so focused on these couple of names. And I think in October, we saw when the markets bottomed, we saw this market rally started to broaden out and everybody got very excited about that. And now that has changed again. And everybody seemed to have forgotten. And now we're back to those five names. So uh, I just think this is a good reminder. Don't be so focused on what's happening this week or this month. You want to have a longer term strategy. And you know, whether rates are coming down next month at the end of this year. I mean, whenever it is, we're probably at the peak of rates we're going to see for a while. And if rates come down, you're going to see a lot of other areas start to benefit in the markets. You want to make sure you're invested there before that changes, not after. To Bob's point, don't chase the rally. Be invested as a long-term investor now. Don't wait for that. So, Court, I had a, uh, a client actually call me this morning who um, didn't see you, but saw Ryan. And, you know, he has a lot of... Uh, a lot of his company's working capital plus some of his personal capital tied up in the in short-term treasuries at 5%. He said, you know, I think Ryan's right. He said, you know, after inflation and taxes, I don't make anything. You know, is there something else we can do with that money? Um, and, and it is. You know, when you're in a higher tax bracket, you're much better off in municipal bonds. And, of course, inflation is that hidden insidious tax that is that everybody's plans at risk when it comes to inflation, right? We had a 9% inflation rate, guys, not that long ago. And now we believe it's at two. Federal Reserve doesn't, but we think it is. But nonetheless, it's it's always there. So it's, you know, building a portfolio to protect you against inflation is more important than probably anything else we ever talk about. Probably one of the more brilliant things I've said on TV. And I mean, there's a lot, Chris told me. Well, you know, clearly this client was a good friend of mine. He said, yeah, Ryan's intelligence clearly comes from his mother. No one's a bigger fan of Ryan than Ryan. <laughs> Well, you know, this morning I gave a, a, a 401k presentation and, um, you know, one of the things I talked about was the fact that people get very emotional, you know, when the stock market is volatile upwards or downwards. And you know, the CFO of the company came up to me afterwards. He said, Chris, you know, I listen to your podcast every week. I listen to Ryan Bob. You know, I listen to Ryan, the Ryan and Courtney on TV. You know, I don't understand how people could be emotional if they have a well-diversified income producing wow. portfolio. She's like, you know, if you're getting great income, then who cares what the market's doing? Of course, it's going to go up eventually. Well, you know, it, it, you always have intelligent in, in investors. They're not really intelligent. It's educated, right? You have, once somebody's informed, an informed investor, and they understand that volatility is part of the game, and it's something not to be feared, but something to be gamed, actually, right? Something to take advantage of. You know, you have a saying, good long-term investor. But at the margins, you guys all know, at uh, 10% at the margins, there are people that are way too negative or way too positive and too emotional. And there's not a heck of a lot you can do for those folks. Yeah. And I would also warn right now, I think more than ever, is things can get crazier, right? I mean, they can get absolutely get wilder. And I know, Courtney, you and I were working with a client recently that never talks about artificial intelligence. All of a sudden is asking us like, hey, is it smart to put an AI fund into our portfolio? Mm -hmm. I've also been getting a lot more Bitcoin questions, artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think it is a sign that, yeah, that speculation is still there, um, which is actually fascinating. So Bitcoin just surpassed the level of Berkshire Hathaway, which is fascinating. At the same time that Microsoft is now bigger than the entire energy sector and the SPF 100 is bigger, I think, what, than the entire European 
markets. Is that right? The Magnificent Seven is bigger than yes, any that's right. Just the market seven across stocks. the world, seven stocks. Yeah. So just to talk about the speculation that's happening, which we absolutely hear, you know, kind of boots on the ground from our own clients, but you're seeing that bigger picture as everything is moving into just this really speculative areas, which does get, that's really when you start to see things like bubbles. You get that irrational exuberance. You know, I don't, I don't know over there yet. I think, Brian, to your point, I think these things can go higher, but you just don't want to get caught up in that. Um, and that's where, Chris, you bring up 401ks, which I think is a really good, good point. That volatility you can really use to your opportunities, especially in your 401ks, where you are adding money there on a regular basis. Every paycheck, the markets go down. That's fantastic. You are getting a lot more shares for that paycheck of what you're buying into your 401k that it really works into your opportunities. So you just want to make sure that you are properly invested, taking advantage. And yeah, just don't chase these things because as exciting as they might may seem, um, these things just can't go up to infinity forever. And you want to make sure that you're, you don't have all of your eggs in that, those baskets. Well, I got to tell you guys, you know, once these speculative trends get going, you know, the trend followers come on board. And remember, there's $7 trillion still sitting in money market funds. And there are a lot of people suddenly getting bored with 5%. And that FOMO, that fear of missing out, is, is going to kick in. So I expect these speculative bubbles to go even higher. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 150, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, Bob, Chris, Cordy, and I will run for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, the best way to take Social Security. There's lots of ways to take it, one right way for you, how to draw from your portfolio when you're financially independent, so you don't run out of money, we'll build a full dynamic income plan. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been all over the place the last two, three years as markets have been extremely volatile? Or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll tie it to your goals. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, insurance product, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost on your portfolio and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you qualify and you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. So Bob, Chris, Courtney, when it comes to the thousand or so families that we manage here, pain capital management, helping with all their wealth decisions, you know, it's really been trial and error over many, many years. And back in the dark ages or the late 70s, early 80s, you know, Bob, you came up with a lot of philosophies um, and a lot of ways of doing things that we still do today. So I thought I would hit you guys with a couple statements and you can tell me, does this fit into our philosophy or no way? This doesn't fit into the pain capital philosophy at all or a Bobism as we like to call it here at pain capital. And the first one is you should always pay off your house as soon as you can. Yay or nay? Well, I'm going to say nay to that, Rye, simply because of anecdotal evidence I have from my good buddies and a divorce attorney in the Philadelphia area, that more marriages have been saved by the mortgage than ever in the history of his career. No one wants to sell their home. They get rid of the 2.5% mortgage, so they're they're getting together and they're not getting divorced. So it's uh, if, that keep, if that keeps couples happy, I'm all for it, buddy. Marriage Advice for Longevity by Bob Payne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not sure if it's good advice or not. Well, uh, the jury's still out. Why'd you stay together for so long? The mortgage. That's it. <laughs> That's it. But I'll tell you what, a lot of people do not want to sell their home right now because they have a, a low interest rate. But, you know, when it comes to debt, debt's an emotional thing. It's just like investing in anything. You know, we, we base it on our emotions. And if you can't sleep at it, I don't care how low the interest rate is on a mortgage or any debt you have. If you can't sleep at night, I always say sell it down to the sleeping point. Get to the point, pay it off, all of it or some of it, because sleep is more important 
than uh, making a smart financial decision on debt. Yeah, well said, Bob. And you know, bottom line is, you know, for a lot of people now, where rates are at like seven percent, well, it might be better to pay off as quick as possible because your investment portfolio is going to have a lot of trouble outperforming that over time. So here's one I think I know the answer to. But I'm going to throw this one to Courtney. Individual bonds are better than bond funds. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I'm sure any of our regular listeners will know our answer to this. But we do not like bond funds. We have never liked bond funds. We will never like bond funds. Uh, but the problem is when interest rates go up and bond prices can go down, this is what all everybody saw in 2022 that happened. But if you have an individual bond, it doesn't matter so much because you can say, well, I'm just going to wait for that bond to mature. So if I know it's maturing in five years from now, I know I'm going to get my money back and I'm going to keep getting interest between now and then. But with a bond fund, rates go up, your bond price goes down. There's no maturity date on that. So that can fluctuate a lot like a stock fund can. And there's no assurance that, okay, I know at a certain date what the price is going to be in the future. What's even worse is we were talking about how investors aren't always extremely rational. So what happens is when the price goes down on a bond, you get a lot of people say, oh, I want to sell that thing that's not doing well, which puts more selling pressure and can make it go down further. So you can actually tend to have more volatility with a bond fund than you can an individual bond. So if you're going to own bonds and they have a very important place in your portfolio, you want to physically own a bond outright. Do not own a bond fund. Yeah, think of a bond fund as the Trojan horse of the bond world. They're called bonds. They're marketed like bonds, but they don't act like bonds because, according to Courtney's point, they have equity-like volatility. There's no set rate of interest, and they don't come due. All right. We know where you guys stand on that. Um, <laughs> no bond funds here at Payne Capital Management. <laughs> the other one that we get questions on all the time are annuities or rip-off, or is it the greatest thing since sliced bread to get consistent income for life? How do you guys feel about that? I think we can all agree. Big ripoff. Well, I would say it depends on the situation, but we've analyzed a lot of annuities in our day. And what we found is, for the most part, you're probably better off investing the money on your own than giving it to an insurance company who tends to make out better in the deal. I know that sounds shocking, but with all the anecdotal evidence that we have, that's usually the case. Well, you know, guys, I'll tell you what, from my experience, um, we have an annuity expert at our firm, Angelique, you guys all know well. And I'm just amazed at how you get her in front of an annuity salesperson, how she runs circles around these because they don't understand the product they're selling. <laughs> it's it's pretty surprising. And these things are so complex, I can understand why they don't understand them. So they sell the sizzle. They don't understand the steak. Um, and my goodness, I haven't analyzed an annuity yet where you couldn't have done something better, something simpler, and something less expensive with your money than invest in an insurance product like an annuity. Well, and a lot of times, too, it's like, okay, we take your principal, you don't get it back, and we pay you out slowly over time, and they give you all these great rates, like 6 7% on their quote-unquote fan phantom value. When anything's called a phantom value, <laughs> that's not a real value. And what ends up happening is they're just paying your money back with a smaller amount of return over time, and they're playing the actuarial table. So, you know, Bob, I always love to use your uh, metaphor when it comes to annuities. Uh, they taste, it's kind of like, you know, the sales pitch sounds so good. And then you feel empty later, like Chinese food. It tastes so good going down, but you feel so empty later. I think that's exactly what it's like when most of you buy an annuity. Because every time we unwind one of these, it's like, it sounded like a good idea. I don't really understand how it works. Maybe I shouldn't be in this. And a lot of times that's definitely the case. Or it's like getting money back after your taxes. You know, you're excited when you get it, but when you find out it was your money in the first place. <laughs> I like that, Chris. Well, another uh, agree or disagree, a statement that I'll make uh, that you're going to agree or disagree with is it's better to have a fee-based advisor or an old school commission broker. Chris, I feel like uh, you're on the side of those old school commission brokers. Am I wrong or right? <laughs> You know, I miss the heady days of just trading stocks and making commissions, or I, you know, you really earned your dollar in those days. But no, I, I, uh, I would definitely say uh, the better situation is a fee-based advisor. Um, you know, that that way, like in paying capital management, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility. That means we have to do what's in the best interest of our clients. That also means that we have a vested interest in their success, their financial plan. We're picking, we're picking the investment products that best suit their needs and their ability to achieve their goals. The other thing I find surprising about the financial services industry. Is nothing surprises me. Um, I mean, years ago, after the 2008 crash, a good friend of mine brought his his father to me, and it and his, and his stockbroker. It was a commission broker. 
had him 100% in the stock market, regardless of the fact that he was 75 years old living on a fixed income, because the broker didn't believe in, in bonds. And his explanation was, well, Warren Buffett doesn't invest in bonds. <laughs> well, what's that got to do you know, with your client? And that's the problem with a commissioned salesperson is they can do whatever they want. They're, they're, they're basically not accountable to you as the investor, as a fiduciary is. So, you know, they're registered representatives of the company. And the problem is when you run into an issue, they take the side of the company. They don't take your side as the investor. So, you know, I will, uh, if I had to hire a fee-based advisor, I'd hire you guys because, you know, you have to put my interest first and invest my money like it's your own. That's a very comforting thought for me. Sadly, Bob, you don't make my minimum, but Chris would be happy to help you. Maybe I'm not sure you'd make Courtney's minimum either. So That's right, Rye. If I did hire you, I'd pay in phantom income anyway. <laughs> the other one that amazes me now is, you know, we think a lot about tax efficiency. Um, Courtney, I know you design a lot of plans where you're, you're always putting tax efficiency as at the forefront is why would anyone own a mutual fund when you can own an ETF nowadays, an exchange traded fund where the tax implications are just so much better which can exchange traded funds. Yeah, and actually I find a lot of people don't realize this. So ETFs are typically a lower cost than a mutual fund, which is one easy reason that you want to be in an ETF as opposed to a mutual fund Um, because they're very similar products, right? Like if you want to own the S&P 500, you can own a mutual fund that owns the S&P 500 or an ETF that owns the S&P 500. But the ETF not only tends to be cheaper, but it's more tax efficient. The reason being is they have to distribute capital gains every year in a mutual fund. And this has actually happened. We've seen this in years where the stock markets are down. But at some point in that year, the mutual fund did have to sell holdings within it. And so it has to send out capital gains distributions to you. So you're paying taxes on capital gains in a year where your fund actually went down. Whereas an ETF, you're only paying capital gains in the year where you individually sell your shares of that ETF. So you can decide in which years you're paying your capital gains, how much you want to pay, and you can be a lot more strategic about it. So that's why an ETF is a much better tax strategy than a mutual fund. There you go. You heard it here first. Well, that's why you know we've become such big believers in index funds. You go by every study over the last 100 years, or just another recent study done, went through every single asset class, regardless of what it was, small cap growth, the real estate, you know, to international. And over 90% of the portfolio managers have underperformed on a 5, 10, 15, 20-year basis. Over 90%. Now, the few that have been able to outperform, they still can't figure out whether they're smart or lucky. So, you know, I don't know why anybody would pay their hard-earned money to figure it out when the studies show over and over again that no one, mostly no one, can under outperform their underlying index. Well, I'll call Chris. He once told me I'd rather be lucky than good. <laughs> All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, last year, U.S. imports from Mexico surpassed those from China for the first time in 20 years. During 2023, the value of goods imported to the U.S. from Mexico exceeded $475 billion, while Chinese imports approximated $427 billion, reported by the Commerce Department just two weeks ago. You know, it's interesting. When everybody recognizes that everything was being manufactured in China, suddenly it wasn't, right? No one thought of our southern neighbor as being somewhere where all that manufacturing would occur. So we have this nearshoring, onshoring going on. Meanwhile, the Mexican stock market's hitting all-time record highs. Yeah, absolutely booming. In fact, it actually surpassed the S&P 500 last year in performance. So uh, Latin America definitely looks strong here. Diversify that portfolio, folks. Viva la Mexico. Viva la Mexico, exactly. Court, Amazon was probably the largest delivery company in the U.S. last year, with 2023 deliveries projected last November to approximate 5.9 billion packages, outpacing both UPS and FedEx, according to a November 27 Wall Street Journal article. Which is fascinating. I mean, we think of Amazon as you know such a multifaceted business. They started out selling books. Um, you now order everything there. We get batteries. I get my diapers from Amazon. Um, they're a big web services now. And now they're actually taking over UPS and FedEx. You know, I don't. I don't know what Amazon can't do at this point. So <laughs> it uh, it's part of our portfolio, and it's just one of the reasons our clients have been doing so well recently. Yeah, stock's been up uh, a lot in the last year. And the only thing I wonder about though is, at some point, do they get hit with some sort of antitrust suit? Who knows? 
could be down one. Chris, the cocoa market was the strongest performing commodity in 2023, with London cocoa finishing 2023 up 70%. The relentless move higher has continued into 2024, with London, London cocoa rallying an additional 37%. Both contracts have hit record highs this year. Concerns over West African supply, specifically on the Ivory Coast and Ghana, have driven the market a lot higher. Man, oh man, Chris, uh, it's a lot more expensive to drink that hot cocoa. You know, the world loves its chocolate. Chocolate makes everybody happier, and uh, it is a commodity. And for all of our clients out there, we own it in the portfolio, so keep eating that chocolate. Good to know. My whole portfolio consists of NVIDIA and Cocoa Futures, so I'm retiring this week. Thanks, guys. It's been real. Uh, another great episode. <laughs> Court, thanks for joining us today. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. You can subscribe to our channel there. If this is on Spotify, you can also subscribe to the channel. Give us a like. And if you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can also like this episode. You can subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.